Folks, good morning. Uh, this is Ignacio Della Torre with the, the board of the San Diego Bonsai Club. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're at the beautiful Japanese Friendship Garden in Balboa Park in San Diego. Uh, just walking around our collection. We're gonna take a look at that here shortly. Uh, if you've not been to the Friendship Garden, you, you really have to come visit. It's, it's a beautiful garden and I, I can't show much of it from where I'm standing. I'm gonna flip this around just so you can see some of uh, some trails that, that head down to the lower garden. There's an upper garden and a lower garden. I'm only showing a very small portion of it. It's just a beautiful, beautiful garden. We're thankful to the staff, uh, Amico Scudder and, and others here at the garden who've allowed us to come in before they open today to do this, this segment. And again, as part of the, the board wanting to make certain that folks have the ability to still receive good content. We decided we, we would have this, uh, this session this morning. I want to thank again Bob Pressler and Jason Saito, uh, Bob with the California Bonsai Society, Jason with Daiichi Bonsai Kai, who uh, have helped us to understand how to use social media, how to use Facebook Live to hold these sessions. Should be a nice, uh, nice morning and again thanks for joining us. We are joined today uh, with Sue Carter, our president there in the background, and our presenter, Neil Allwater. Uh, Neil is a curator of the, the San Diego Bonsai Club collection at the Friendship Garden. He's been the curator for about two years and a member for just over 10 years. Neil is gonna step us through the collection, talk about a number of trees, and then uh, introduce us to individual trees and what it's taken to, to get them into a show quality state. So. Uh, we're going to plug in uh, Neil here, if you just give me a second, and we should be ready to go. Okay. And if somebody, would, once Neil starts speaking, if somebody can just confirm that you can hear Neil. We are all, all masked up and gloved up, as you might be able to see, but uh, Neil, it's, it's all yours. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, here at the beautiful 12-acre San Diego uh, Friendship Garden, uh, the San Diego Bonsai Club maintains the smaller of its two collections. The larger one is at the uh, Safari Park, 30 miles to the north. And I thought I'd start by taking you on a tour of our uh, display area and then uh, talk a little bit about some selected bonsai fundamental horticultural points. Um, Fred uh, Miyahara, who still comes out to help us with our pines, uh, was out here one time and he told me that the bonsai collection actually began many years ago as just a way to have stock to be able to place a bonsai in an indoor tokonoma here at the garden. And eventually somebody came up with the idea of having a bonsai display area outside and uh, the San Diego Bonsai Club entered into an agreement with the Friendship Garden in about 2013 uh, to maintain the collection which belongs to the club uh, and this spring uh, the club uh, the uh, garden uh, decided to build an enclosure for aesthetic and uh, security reasons and uh, this area here was completely open and the only arbor was right there against the building now the footprint of the arbor goes all the way around the collection uh, there are fixed panels on the side doors on the entryways and uh, there are removable panels on this side of the enclosure that go up every night and come down every morning. Uh, and at night, the trees that are outside go inside the enclosure, except for the big, the big pine there. So let's take a little tour of, uh, of our collection. Uh, this Japanese black pine uh, from Fred Dixon has been uh, a bonsai for almost 50 years. It's kind of the king of our collection. Um, and uh, we just love it. Uh, it it uh, got a vacation from candling this year. Only a few, a little selective candling at the top where it was very heavy. We're just letting it, uh, letting it run to gain strength. And this tree this forest of uh, winged elm was donated by Mark Edgar on a beautiful slab. Uh, this Shimpaku juniper is from Masishi. And 
into really uh, distinctive, almost black, unglazed pot. This California juniper is from Sherwin Amamoto. Uh, it's by far the oldest tree we have in the collection. It's two to three hundred years old. It's only been a bonsai for about 20 years. But uh, the next oldest tree we have, uh, probably the big pine and the Spogenvillea are maybe in the 60 uh, to 80 year range. This is our only California juniper currently hint, hint, and we're very proud of it. Uh, this tree offset behind the California juniper. This might be a better angle. I don't know. Is uh, a cork bark black pine. Uh, I got that uh, a couple years ago from uh, Mr. Tarashi Kusumoto, uh, who closed his Kusumoto Bonsai Nursery in Fallbrook. Um, and it was in a 15 gallon pot. And now it belongs to the club. And uh, Mr. Uh, Kusumoto uh, sold all his bonsai collection a couple years ago. And one of, the, one of my fellow uh, club members, uh, Dave Moore, took a picture of him when he was out there. And uh, when he came home, he astutely noticed that uh, Mr. Kusumoto is in uh, a pretty iconic photograph of John Naka uh, teaching maybe a dozen Japanese American young men demonstrating on a tree. And they're all sitting wrapped with attention. And on the very right side of that picture, which you can find very easily if you just Google John Naka teaching uh, in, in a straight profile is Mr. Kusumoto as a very young man in 1962. And he's 83 now. This Bougainvillea uh, from Frank Trost, uh, I'm told was actually planted elsewhere in Balboa Park in the landscape for the 1935 uh, Cal Pacific Exposition. And it obviously grew in the ground probably for decades. And how it got taken out of the landscape and found its way to Frank Trosk and then to our collection, I don't know. That's, uh, that's way before my time. Uh, this is one tree where the color is not great. And um, I took the pH uh, last month and it was 7.5 in the substrate. And we'll talk a little bit more about pH uh, in a while. But uh, 7.5 is pretty far outside of the comfort zone for a bougainvillea. They're very acid loving. It would rather be at like 4.5 to 6.5. So I put some uh, uh, acid reducing fertilizer on there uh, to try to, uh, try to improve it. Uh, the next tree behind their offset, that's an Al Nelson scrub oak. There aren't a lot of scrub oaks uh, as bonsai. Uh, they don't seem to uh, behave as predictably as a California live oak. They're a little more cantankerous, um, but uh, I love them. And it's in a really beautiful pot that John Jackson gave us that uh, I think really picks up the bluish hue in the leaves. And uh, so it's, it's got some growing to do, but I, I look forward to that being a great tree someday. And Alan Nelson also gave us a, a California live oak that we have in our, uh, our nursery area. Uh, this uh, Nana Japanese garden juniper, uh, Kathy Edgar got from the Bish estate years ago. And I've seen pictures of it. it. It looked like it had just been growing for maybe 30 years. And she found a picture in the 1988 Kukufu album of a tree with a similar uh, trunk. Uh, a juniper, and she, over the years, uh, styled this tree to look like that. And um, it's it's on page, I think, 188 of the 1988 <laughs> album. If you ever see it, it's remarkable. She she just created a beautiful tree, and it looks like uh, 
not a clone, but uh, obviously very inspired by this great Kokofu tree. The moss is suffering in our San Diego summer. That's, that's part of San Diego's uh, dry weather and uh, alkalinity in our water, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, but it'll green up in the summer. Uh, this forest has actually been uh, in the shade, in mostly shade for about three months, and so its, uh, it's moss is doing great. Um, this was put together by Larry Ragel at a two-day uh, Festival of Japan exhibition at Disneyland in the early mid-80s, and he and Nina uh, donated it to the San Diego Bonsai Club, and uh, it's, it's probably, from a, a visitor perspective, our biggest showstopper. And we've got it kind of planted low because kids really love to be able to see into that forest. Uh, this beautifully ramified olive came from Dave Woodall. And uh, Ignacio, our cameraman, and I were working here one, one morning, and it was in need, last year, it was in need of uh, repotting, and it was starting to suffer a little bit. And we were looking at it and kind of murmuring, gee, what's going on here? What's the problem? And these two young women just appeared out of nowhere, and one of them said, with a very concerned look on her face, uh, she said, is there something wrong with that tree? It's my grandfather's. And so we said, oh, oh no, uh, no, no, it just, uh, it just needs repotting. It's fine, it's fine. And she's like, okay. So if you've got a Dave Woodall tree, be very careful. He's got ears everywhere. Uh, this prostrata juniper was donated by Margaret Carl. She was a longtime student of John Naka. I really love that tree. Yeah. This pomegranate uh, was at the Safari Park collection, and uh, they acquired a couple of uh, new uh, pomegranates, one from John Jackson and the other from uh, Lindsay Sheba, that are uh, enormous and fantastic. And they have other uh, pomegranates. Their, their bench is very deep on pomegranates, so they uh, transfer this one over to us. Um, we have one, a smaller pomegranate uh, that's uh, in the nursery area from Glenn Jensen. But this is from uh, Bruce and Yeko Hiseyasu. Uh, Bruce died in 2016, and uh, they had a bonsai nursery, sold pottery from inside of their garage in uh, Pasadena, I think it was, and at some point they gave this tree to the San Diego Bonsai Club. Oh yeah, this, this prop is just to uh, get this branch down here on this level. Uh, it was kind of up there crowding this branch. But if you watch uh, Mirai Live, uh, and if you've seen the series uh, that Ryan did recently on Icons of August, he did two episodes on uh, what he calls the, uh, the Naka juniper. It's one of his uh, John Naka California junipers. And that tree also came from Mr. Hisayasu. If, if you haven't seen it, Ryan, Ryan tells a really great story about coming back from his apprenticeship with Mr. Kimura in 2011 and immediately driving from Portland to uh, Los Angeles to thank all the people who were instrumental in getting him uh, that uh, apprenticeship. And one of the people that we went to see was Mr. Hisayasu and he admired uh, this John Naka California juniper that Mr. Hisayasu had in his collection. And uh, then he left, and at the end of the weekend, he got in his car and he started driving north again. And he was in the grapevine almost to the Central Valley, and he got a phone call. And it was uh, Mr. Hisayasu, and he said, You know that juniper, you can have it. 
And so he got off the freeway, or he turned around and drove back and got that tree. And so that's the same Bruce Hesayasu that gave our club this wonderful tree. This is a great uh, Shimpaku juniper given to us by Tak Shimazu. Beautiful tree. This small femina juniper is from Jim Barrett. Uh, Jim also gave us a beautiful uh, Chinese elm uh, last August that uh, was damaged by a vandal at night, which is what prompted the, uh, the garden to build this enclosure. And uh, that tree had all the branches pretty much broken off on one side, but uh, it's got a new potting angle for springtime and uh, it's gonna be fine. And thank you for both of these trees, uh, Jim, if you're watching. Uh, this is uh, a viewing stone from the Ragels, same as the uh, Femina Forest. And this huge viewing stone that weighs about 30 kilos uh, is from Ko Tsushima. Uh, he was one of the San Diego Bonsai Club's founding members. Uh, I bought this very interesting pot from him, which I keep as a treasure. It's uh, sort of deep like a semi-cascade, but it's elongated. It's very unusual. I haven't found the tree for it yet, but uh, I always think of Ko. When I look at that pot in my pot collection, and uh, Steve Valentine told me a story about Co. One time when I first joined the club, uh, it was at one of our shows, either a spring or a fall show, and uh, he said that uh, somebody showed up with Co. Who was probably maybe 90, in his 80s at least, and uh, it was a motorist who'd been driving down the highway, the 163, and saw an elderly man with a ceremonial red uh, robe walking down the shoulder of the highway on a Saturday morning. And he stopped and uh, picked him up and it was Co. Co was walking from his house in Claremont, which is at least six miles north of Balboa Park, to the show on a Saturday morning. Uh, that's a stalwart San Diego Bonsai Club founder And Ko, Ko's no longer with us. Okay, come over here to my demonstration table and talk a little bit about bonsai. Um, you know, uh, bonsai is, uh, is uh, a really distinctive form of art uh, it is a collaboration between the, you and your tree. You work together, you both make a contribution, and then if the tree changes hands, it becomes a collaboration with everyone who lays hands on it afterwards, maybe generations of people. And so uh, uh, unlike a painting or a sculpture or a photograph that's sort of fixed in time and captures a moment, uh, a bonsai tree is constantly changing. and it's worked on by many people, uh, so it's sort of a, a piece of art by committee if it's a tree that is multi-generational. Uh, and I think, to me, that's sort of a good uh, example of uh, the Eastern view about time and age compared to the Western view. Westerners, in general, uh, sort of see time as a series of frozen snapshots and if they create something good like a painting you want to capture it you want to fix it and keep it and make sure it's always going to be that way and uh, uh, a bonsai tree isn't like that uh, it exemplifies the eastern view about 
uh, time and age that uh, nothing is perfect, nothing is finished, and nothing lasts. Um, so you can have a moment of excellence that you achieve in a bonsai tree um, or a mistake, but neither of them is going to last. They're going to change over time, and that's something that we don't fret about. Uh, we try to embrace it, and I really think that uh, to uh, heighten your senses to uh, things, a bonsai tree being a, an example, that are transitory um, helps people uh, in understanding their own impermanence and in, uh, in having a, an appreciation for uh, things that are old and bear the scars of age. Um, so I think there's, there's an underlying worldview or philosophy behind uh, the Eastern practice of bonsai that I think even a Western practitioner um, benefits from. Um, horticulture. Uh, you know, we have a short amount of time here today and uh, there's no way to dive into every aspect of bonsai horticulture. So, and there are a lot of other sources, a lot of other great sources. If you don't already listen to uh, uh, Boone online or uh, ICIN, uh, Bjorn, Bjorn Holmes uh, Bonsai U free channel and his uh, paid content and uh, Mariah Live, Ryan Neal as a combination of free content and fantastic subscription content. If you don't already subscribe or listen to and watch one of those, um, I highly recommend it. So those places and a lot of others, I'm going to stop because we've got a plane going overhead. There are a lot of places to get good content on bonsai horticulture. And so in the limited time I have, I want to talk about uh, mostly things that uh, are particular to our region. Uh, we live here in beautiful Southern California, but it is a desert. And the summers are long uh, and dry, and the water is very, uh, has high alkalinity and high pH. And that can be a problem for a lot of bonsai trees. Um, so I want to talk about four things, and in each topic just have three main points in the time that we have. Uh, I want to talk about soil, uh, and then watering, then fertilizing, and then uh, pests and diseases. On soil, um, you know, everybody's got a recipe that they uh, endorse, uh, a combination usually of porous uh, granular components like uh, lava, pumice, akadama, and some people use organic components like uh, fine fir bark, uh, shredded sphagnum moss. Uh, some people still use potting soil. We had a, a demonstrator uh, who's an expert in Japanese uh, maples uh, last year, and he did a, uh, a forest um, right there for us, and he uses um, potting soil with uh, some pumice mixed in. Uh, and you can do that. You know, the uh, porous sub modern substrate of bonsai soil is a relatively recent thing. But if you have a lot of fines in your soil, dirt, the stuff, the fine particles that you find in uh, potting soil, your, accurate, your uh, watering has to be really, really accurate because that water doesn't all just flow through there. Uh, the porous bonsai soil particles allow almost all the water to go right through and it becomes a little harder for you to overwater your tree and, and cause damage in that way. Uh, one thing I recommend because of our very alkaline water with high pH is for your acid loving trees, first of all, if you have a tree, you should take, uh, just uh, go online and look for uh, bonsai tree pH and you'll quickly find a list that uh, Harry Harrington has posted that has almost every bonsai species that's commonly used and what its comfort zone of pH is. So it's good to know that about your tree. Uh, and if you've got an acid loving tree, uh, you might consider using some uh, organic materials. The fir bark, the uh, shredded sphagnum moss, because they actually, uh, to some extent, reduce pH and reduce soil alkalinity, uh, which is good. And also they help uh, retain moisture. Uh, and one technique that uh, there's a, a Ryan Neal stream on this is when you get 
to the top of the pot, you're, you're potting something and you're maybe a half inch from the top, is to take uh, wet shredded sphagnum moss and kind of make a spider web configuration of it, not a thick solid uh, pad of it. And then you fill it in with the last layer of soil. And the sphagnum moss ends up being concealed, but it knits together with the soil and it stabilizes. So you're less likely to have your soil just wash off the top of the pot. And also keeps the top layer of soil uh, moister longer and helps you be able to have a top layer of soil that's inhabitable by roots. Uh, the second thing I want to mention about uh, bonsai soil is that in between uh, your full repottings, um, you might want to consider doing uh, what Ryan calls a percolation improvement. Um, a lot of times you'll see that the top of your pot gets very crusty, uh, it's shedding water, the water's either going off the side or it's just sitting there on the top. And it may not be that the pot is fully occupied by roots, you know, maybe the pot's, the tree's not rising up out. It may not need a full repot. It's often enough and much easier and less disruptive to the tree if the tree still has room in there to grow to just basically uh, repot the top half inch or inch of soil. Basically take a chopstick or uh, a root rake and in a radial direction, so you're not going across and hacking off those roots along the top, in a radial direction, take off that old soil, which uh, becomes a, uh, a hard layer. The soil on top uh, degrades faster because it's hit by the sun every day, it's hit by the water every day, and also uh, the residue from the fertilizer uh, tends to build up there. So if you could just remove that um, and then replace that with new soil, and if it's, uh, if it's a tree that you have water retention issues on or if it's an acid loving tree to incorporate uh, some of the sphagnum moss into the top layer, that can often get you by uh, and your full repot can wait for another couple of years. The third and last thing I want to say about soil uh, is uh, soil inoculation. Um, we, I, I think everybody who does bonsai is familiar. There, there are certain species that rely heavily on mycorrhiza, which is a interrelationship of beneficial fungus in the soil and microbes like bacteria and the root hairs on your tree. They, uh, they enable the root hairs to take up uh, nutrients uh, more efficiently. Um, but what some people don't know is that 80% of trees are to some extent reliant on mycorrhiza. It's not just pines uh, and junipers. Also oaks are heavily reliant on mycorrhiza uh, and 80% uh, of the other trees that you might have. And uh, when we pot a tree, especially if we bare root it and you take away all that native soil, um, you really, uh, you can remove the mycorrhiza uh, colony. And so uh, eventually it will reestablish itself. But to speed things up, you can inoculate your soil uh, with uh, uh, mycorrhiza. You can buy straight mycorrhiza. There's endo and ecto. Uh, ecto has um, fungi, the mycelium, the little legs uh, sort of wrap around the root tips and endo, they actually penetrate the root tips and they actually can inject uh, bacteria into the plant um, that travel throughout the plant and disgorge themselves of the nutrients they collected in the soil and then they go back and the root hairs actually shoot those bacteria out and the root hair travel along the mycelia of the, of the fungus so that they can quickly get to an area where they can get uh, nutrients again. So the, uh, the uh, fungus actually acts as sort of a microbe superhighway for microbes to go get, uh, uh, get nutrients. And then um, the, my, the uh, tree roots are actually farming the uh, mycorrhiza. They, some trees give up to 30% of their sugars and starches to the fungal colony and the microbes that are in the soil, not to the tree itself, because they get so much in return. And uh, if, you, uh, if you ever tune into uh, Peter Warren's uh, bonsai channel, Sar Saruyama, um, about a month ago, he had a long discussion with uh, an agricultural microbiologist 
uh, about um, how plants use microorganisms, mycorrhizae bacteria. And she said, had fantastic pictures of uh, uh, tree roots actually taking up little bacteria that you could see. And they'll go all the way out to the tip of the roots and they dump their nitrogen, whatever else they have that the tree wants. And the, the tree roots actually secrete an enzyme that causes these bacteria to shed their outer coating so they become small enough to be absorbed by the tree roots. It's just, uh, it's, it's fascinating. This is, uh, this is Dr. Earth uh, root zone. Dr. Earth has a lot of products, a lot of fertilizers. This is for uh, an initial potting or a repotting. It has, um, uh, it has several kinds of uh, mycorrhiza, the fungus, and it has many kinds of bacteria, the subtlest bacteria. Um, and it was interesting that uh, this microbiologist that Peter Warren was talking to said that um, actually the fungal, the fungus part of mycorrhiza is pretty quick to reestablish itself. The part that you really benefit from giving a boost is the microbes, the bacteria. Um, and so that uh, when you're doing a first potting or a, a big repotting, if you want to inoculate your tree, uh, she recommends not only use it, <coughs> using uh, a mycorrhiza fungus additive, but also something that has microbes. And this, this Dr. Earth has, has both. Also, when you're doing a big repotting uh, rooting hormone uh, before you pour the soil back on among the roots that you've cut is a good idea. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about water. Um, the first thing I want to say about water is uh, that even more important than what particular soil components you use is maintaining a proper balance of water and oxygen. And I think in general, most people who have problems with their trees are probably giving too much water. It is possible underwater a tree. I think overwatering is probably more the problem. We have a lot of trees that uh, we can't Bear, some trees you just can't bear root when you pot them. And you have a clot of, uh, of native soil or nursery soil in the middle, in the sheen underneath that, uh, that tree. And uh, either it sheds water and doesn't get wet at all, or if it does get wet, it stays wet for a long time. And so um, uh, it's, it's hard to accurately water trees. There are a lot of ways to determine whether your tree needs water. Uh, you can look at the top to see whether the soil particles have become kind of ashy and light colored. Uh, you can do the finger test. You can insert a, a sharpened chopstick in and leave it for a minute and then see, is it mucky? If it's mucky, you're probably overwatering. If there's some visible streaks of water on there, but it's not mucky, um, it doesn't need water. If it's just barely damp or not damp at all, then it's, it's time to water. But I, I feel that uh, one, one method that I use is actually to check the weight of the pot. If you even pick up one side of the pot, the first time you do it, you're gonna say, well, I can't tell anything from this. But if you, if you do it repeatedly, even if you have a lot of trees, eventually you get sort of a muscle memory of how much every pot should weigh when it's saturated. And when that pot weighs a lot less, you know it's time to water. Um, second takeaway on water is I recommend to find a way, if you can, to incorporate rainwater or reverse osmosis water into your summer watering. Um, we have a long dry summer in San Diego. Uh, our, our tap water has a pH of about 8, which is pretty much normal pH is kept high by water authorities everywhere, even where the natural water supply has very low pH, because uh, low pH water, which is acidic, tends to break down pipes and dissolve thing, pipe materials like lead. And uh, so it's by design that pH is kept high. Um, but in reading about soil, some soil biology uh, research for this presentation, uh, I found that um, 
The pH of irrigation water has very little effect on the pH of the substrate of a container plant. It's the alkalinity of the water that matters. Our chemists have given us a gift of using alkaline to describe the part of the pH scale that is base, as synonymous with, uh, with base. Everything above 7, from 7 to 14, and acid is from 7 down to 0. That's, uh, so if someone says my, my water is uh, alkaline, they mean it has a pH higher than 7. Alkalinity is completely unrelated to alkaline. Alkalinity is a measure of the calcium carbonate in the water, uh, which is basically dissolved rocks. And we have alkalinity off the charts in San Diego. Most of our tap water uh, travels through hundreds of miles of the Colorado River's uh, dolomite and limestone, and it picks up dissolved rock. That's what you feel when you're trying to wash your hair uh, versus in Seattle where the alkalinity of the water is, is very, very low. Uh, alkaline water uh, over time builds up minerals in your soil. You see them on the edge of the bonsai pot. You can see them in the tips of some plants that collect salt in their tips. Uh, and calcium carbonate is, is a salt from a chemist's uh, standpoint. Um, and uh, it pushes pH in the substrate up. And if it gets high enough, uh, uh, then you cannot bring the pH down. And it's important to have the pH in the tree's comfort zone because the solubility of all of the nutrients that you put in the plant when you fertilize it uh, need to be in a certain range of pH. Normally it's like between five and seven on a pH scale. Uh, but as I said before, it varies from, from tree to tree. Uh, some of our trees, like an olive, a silverberry, can go up to 8 on the pH scale, no problem. Almost no tree likes it above 8. And if we uh, pour our alkaline, uh, high pH water into our trees, uh, and that's all they get from, say, May to middle December, uh, the pH can go way up. So what do you do about that? Well, if your trees appear to be in great health, then I wouldn't worry about pH. Um, you know, you sometimes see people on the internet saying, just don't worry about pH at all, it never matters. That's usually somebody who lives in a place where their trees are getting a regular supply of rainwater. And yeah, you don't really have to worry about it. But uh, when you live in a desert and you have a long arid period, and if you don't have access to rainwater or RO water, rainwater and, RO and reverse osmosis water have no alkalinity. There's virtually no salts in them, um, and their your trees love them. I mean, you see that when it rains. Um, you see how the trees respond to it. And if you can find a way to uh, capture rainwater from your roof by diverting a downspout, I have nine 30-gallon trash cans and a, and a diverter on uh, our gutter. Um, uh, if you don't have gutters, you can find a place on the roof where the runoff is heavy and, uh, and catch it there. If you have a 10-foot tarp, like a, a, a plastic tarp, and you can rig it so that the low point drops into a trash can, one inch of rain on 10 square feet is 30 gallons of water. So, uh, and then you can have an RO system. If, if you can't find a way to collect rainwater, uh, reverse osmosis is an option. So if you have trees that are persistently not uh, doing well horticulturally, Consider measuring the pH of your substrate and incorporating uh, some acid uh, acidifying uh, practices with your substrate. And so the one acidifying practice would be use the RO or rainwater, which has no alkalinity and will allow your pH to come down. And the others are uh, things like um, uh, Dr. Earth also makes an acid lover's fertilizer. It has sulfur in it, and uh, it will reduce the pH in your soil. Um, if you don't want to fertilize, but you want to reduce the acid, you can use a soil acidifier. Um, this is just sulfur, granular. Um, but the, yes? I have a question. I don't know if you can hear me. I 
don't know if they can hear me on like so you might need to repeat this but is there something you can add to the water itself to reduce the pH or the acidity um rainwater or reverse osmosis water if you're talking about tap water um then you know i don't i'm not a chemist um so you know i i say i give you that disclaimer when i tell you that i've read from a lot of authoritative sources that the ph of your irrigation water has almost no effect on the ph of the substrate that is of the soil that your roots are sitting in it's the alkalinity and other things going on uh, uh, like the floral colony of, uh, of decomposing organic fertilizer. Uh, these fur chips, they decompose over time. That creates acidity. Um, the sphagnum moss also creates acidity. But uh, something that you can add to tap water, uh, not based on what I read. I know some people will add um, a weak acid like vinegar to their tap water and yeah then if you measure the ph of that tap water it's lower but again the ph of the tap water has very little effect on the ph of the substrate from a chemical standpoint i don't know why that is but i've read it in enough uh horticulture uh literature that i've sort of taken it in um it's the out it's the high alkalinity in the water that is all of the dissolved stone that we get from the colorado river that pushes your pH up. Uh, so if you, um, I want, the way one uh, uh, author put it was, you can put uh, vinegar in tap water and it will have a low pH, but all those salts, all of that calcium carbonate from the Colorado River stone is still in the water. And so when you water your tree with it, those salts build up. And if you get to a certain point, um, uh, of uh, calcium carbonate above, I think it's 120 parts per million. Um, that's what, hoard, what uh, nursery people call a sort of a yellow flag area. If it gets above that, you can't bring your pH down with things like acidifiers, organic fertilizer, soil components. The uh, buffering capacity of uh, a super high amount of alkalinity is so strong that it resists anything you do to try to pull the acidity of the substrate down. So if you have high pH problems persistently, you need to address the alkalinity. And that does, that, that's not something you can add to the water. You need to find a source of water that uh, has less alkalinity. And that would be rainwater or reverse osmosis water. And again, if your trees are flourishing, I would say don't worry about pH. But if you have trees that uh, have persistent problems, um, you can measure the pH um, uh, pretty easily. There are the pH test kits, which are basically the little litmus strips that you put in water uh, to measure the pH. Those are pretty inaccurate. Um, for about $50, you can get a nice pH meter. This is what Jonas Dupuich uh, uses. It's an Aptera. Uh, pH meter, very simple to use. Yeah. And uh, the way gardeners test the, PA, uh, the pH of soil is to dig out a spade of garden soil from several spots and uh, then you mix it with water and then the water takes on whatever properties are in the soil and then you check the pH of the water. We don't normally like to dig out spades of earth from our bonsai trees unless it happens to be repotting time. So there's a much easier way to do it. Um, it's called the, the Cornell University pour through method. Uh, and here's what you do. Um, you water a tree as you normally would to saturation. You let it sit for an hour is what they recommend, but I, I find basically the same results if you wait a half hour. So you water the tree to saturation you let it sit for an hour, and then you tip the tree up and you put some little receptacle under a drain hole to catch the water that runs out. Now, depending on your soil, you may not have water running after an hour after you tip it. 
And in that case, you just take some distilled water and squirt it onto the top of the soil. And really, it doesn't matter what kind of water you use, because when you squirt this water onto the top of the soil of a tip pot, this water is not what's coming out the drain hole. This water will displace water that's further down in the gravity column that's been steeping in your soil, basically making a tea from your bonsai soil. That water, which is called a leachate, uh, comes out of the, the drain hole, and you need about an ounce and a half of that water, and then you measure the pH of that. Oh, yeah, uh, this says rubbing alcohol. It's not, it's uh, distilled <laughs> water. Don't wanna make that mistake. So when you have uh, maybe an ounce of uh, water that comes out of the drain hole, and make sure it doesn't hit anything on the way out. Like if, you're, if the water comes out of the drain hole and runs over a bare piece of wood, that will throw your uh, pH way off. Then you have a small amount of water in a container use something thin that will allow you to have a high column water to be able to submerge the uh, sensor. And uh, you turn it on and you get a highly accurate pH reading within about 30 seconds. Now I say highly accurate because this is an accurate device. It comes with instructions that allow you to very easily uh, calibrate it with a solution that they give you. It's super, this is super easy. I don't mean that it's a 100% accurate measure of the pH in your substrate because, you know, in the process of the water working its way through the substrate, um, there are a lot of things that can happen to throw off uh, pH. It's one of the reasons why if you have uh, a million dollar crop uh, or some very valuable uh, material, you're probably not going to be doing your own pH all the time. Sometimes you'll hire a lab to do it, but that's, that's prohibitively expensive for most people. And the county uh, will no longer, they, they helped us with the problem we were having with the pine a couple of years ago, uh, measuring its uh, pH and various other things that were going on there. Uh, they don't do that for us anymore, they're too busy. Um, so you'll sometimes see online um, somebody who, probably flunk chemistry and now they're growing weed hydroponically in their mother's basement say oh don't even try it's too hard there's too many variables nobody can ever take the ph it can only be done uh, at a lab and uh, you just don't see that when you read the scholarship on the material it's not it may not be a hundred percent accurate but i'm a firm believer that some information even if it may not be a hundred percent accurate is better than just being completely in the dark about what the pH is of your substrate uh, in a plant that's having problems. So um, if your pH is higher, and in San Diego it's almost always gonna be higher. Uh, if it's higher than the comfort zone for the tree that you have, you can use, add acidifying fertilizer. If you don't wanna add fertilizer, use the granular soil uh, acidifier. Uh, uh, this, uh, you can get anywhere. Walter Anderson, uh, everybody has a granular, and I recommend granular everything. The stuff that's powdered or liquid that tends to uh, drench the plant in a quick high dose of whatever it is, be it fertilizer or sulfur, I, I don't think is a good idea. That's, you know, plants don't get their nutrients in uh, quick, heavy doses in nature, and they shouldn't in your bonsai pot either. Something granular or chunky that uh, dissolves a little bit each time you water it is better. Um, so that was the last thing on water. If you're having a problem, uh, check the pH. Uh, if the pH is high, try to bring it down. If you cannot bring the pH down, say you, you use the uh, uh, acidifying fertilizer, you use, uh, you've used some organic materials in your soil, uh, you used uh, some granular sulfur, and you come back in a few months and you haven't been able to bring the pH down at all, that means that your alkalinity is up higher than that yellow flag area. Your alkalinity, which is the calcium carbonate, all the dissolved rocks that are in our tap water, uh, there's so much of that built up in your soil that the soil has a buffering capacity that will not allow the pH to come down. And there's only two ways to address that. If you're a nurseryman and you have a big operation, you can inject a strong acid into your irrigation water, like 
rubber gloves, face mask. That's not for most bonsai people. The second way is to find a way to incorporate a source of water that does not have alkalinity, and that's rainwater and reverse osmosis water. If you're using tap water and your trees are doing fine, you know, disregard all of this stuff that I've said. I'm talking about uh, a tree that you're having problems with. pH is something that, that I recommend looking into. Okay, um, let's talk quickly about uh, fertilization. Three things uh, I recommend. One is, is to match your fertilizer to the stage of development of the tree. If you've got a tree in a nursery can or in a big pot and you've got a lot of uh, developmental goals like scar healing, developing major branches, girth, you can use an inexpensive, relatively high nitrogen, you know, anything maybe up to 10 or 15 fertilizer and not worry about spending a lot of money. I would never put BioGold, which costs $90 for a five kilogram bag onto a nursery can. But if you've got a tree that's in refinement and you're looking for short inner nodes uh, and you're looking for a tree, you're looking for a way that the tree can maintain its health other than by growing rapidly. You know, a tree in a nursery can um, that's growing fast is kind of like a, the growth economy. It stays strong based on growth. That's what keeps its vigor. But when you have a tree in refinement and the rate of growth slows way down and you want it to slow down because you want it to keep, you want it to keep the shape that you've established and you don't want big leaves and you don't want long internodes. You want to slow that Mustang way, way down. Well, it's harder to keep a tree in excellent health when its rate of growth is slowed way, way, way down. And one way you can do it is using a really high quality uh, fertilizer, not high in nitrogen, but high in things like uh, hormones that uh, promote short inner nodes and all of the good things that you find in a good balanced uh, organic fertilizer uh, that has a long list of all the micronutrients, things other than NPK, and the Dr. Earth line of fertilizers is an example of that. Um, uh, BioGold, um, uh, there are a lot of good, good ones on the market. Um, Ryan Neal recommends uh, Dr. Earth fertilizer for when you first pot a tree because it has so many of the uh, things that help you start a colony of mycorrhiza and uh, I think he recommends BioGold um, for trees after the, uh, after the potting stage. There are a lot of fertilizers out there. Um, and also uh, fish emulsion or kelp extract uh, have really important micronutrients that you can add if you're using just sort of a basic Home Depot NPK fertilizer um, and you wanna save some money, you don't have to buy an $80 bag of this. You can uh, uh, use Dr. Earth or you can uh, use uh, the seaweed extract or kelp extract that uh, adds a lot of the micronutrients that the tree needs. Um, so that's uh, matching the fertilizer to the tree stage, considering organic fertilizer. And I, I already mentioned slow release. That's the third thing on fertilizer. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of powdered fertilizers that uh, when you water them, they, they dump their load into the soil all of a sudden. If you have something powdered, like if you like uh, you know, blood meal, that stuff that comes in powder, you can make it into a cake, you know, like brownies. Um, that, there are a lot of demonstrations on the internet to make it into a cake using uh, uh, glue and other stuff. And that way, every time you water it, a little bit uh, releases into the soil. The very, the very last thing I want to talk about is pests and diseases, and uh, three things I recommend. One is examining your trees very closely. Uh, if you have good near vision with your eyes, if you don't have good near vision with some kind of magnification, uh, to try to find uh, pests on your trees before you start to see a whole region sort of brown out from spider mites. Um, you can see aphids. Uh, we had uh, pine needle aphids on this pine tree uh, this uh, winter. Uh, aphids, uh, you can see pretty readily um, juniper scale. 
Uh, you can see pretty readily, it's those little white structures that formed in the clefts, especially of the, uh, junior, of the uh, juvenile foliage. Um, they're white, uh, little scabby looking things. Uh, spider mites are really hard to see with the naked eye, but uh, if you ha you've probably seen this before, you use the paper tap test. You uh, take a piece of white paper, you tap the foliage. On, usually it's a juniper, sometimes a pine. Uh, and then you look for these little white dots that are running around. Um, and uh, if your near vision is not good enough to see them running around, you can sort of wipe the dots with your finger. If they make a streak, that's a live uh, spider mite. Um, if they don't make a streak, then it's, it could be a, dead, a desiccated spider mite. Um, so observe your trees really closely before you start to see a symptom because it, by the time you see a symptom, you are likely to have a really established colony. Uh, the second thing I recommend is once or twice a week, water your foliage, especially on your uh, pines and junipers, briskly with your irrigation water. Like really spray it. Um, spider mites, as as harmful as they are, they are very delicate. They can't hang on very well. They drown fast. And um, if you regularly spray your foliage really well, um, if, if Dow could patent water, we would be buying it uh, as a pesticide. Um, so you can keep a handle on your, uh, on your spider mites and also aphids. Um, Scale is a little harder to uh, get rid of with water. You know, sometimes you really have to use a product, whether it's a horticultural oil or a spray-on poison or a systemic poison. But if you water your trees briskly once or twice a week, um, that helps a lot. Uh, and the, the last thing I want to say on uh, diseases, uh, if you have uh, chronic fungal problems, uh, Phytophthora um, in your junipers, the juniper tip blight, or uh, leaf spot, anything fungal that is going on uh, repeatedly, I would take that as a sign that you might want to cut back on your watering. Uh, Overwatering um, uh, is just a bonanza for, uh, for the detrimental funguses that are out there trying to take down your plant. Um, okay, that's all I had to say. I do have one, I have one quiz question for Sue. To test your bonsai knowledge, can you tell me what what is the Lion King's favorite tree species? The Lion King? Yeah, the Lion King's favorite tree species. Okay, you, it's uh, a western red cedar. <laughs> and why is that? Oh, uh, <laughs> because it's a Thuya Placata. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, save that for last. Um, thanks for watching everybody. Enjoy your trees. A Thuya Placata. Or any questions? questions. Oh, questions. Okay, I don't see any, uh, I don't see any questions at this point. This is fabulous. Wonderful. Okay, Wonderful. thanks. Presentation. Um,